Hello, and welcome to Chester Visual Arts Learning Program's Traveling Presentation on the Woman's Hour Craft Prize. Thank you for joining us, and please visit CVA at our website, chestervisualarts.org.uk, as well as on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to keep up with all of our upcoming exhibitions and programs. This Victorian Albert exhibition tour is brought to our Chester Visual Arts Center and exhibition space by Chester Visual Arts. The exhibition follows CVA's past exhibitions of the hugely successful Victoria and Albert Pop Art and Print Exhibition and Liz West, Our Color Reflection at Chester Cathedral, and is followed by the major Victoria and Albert exhibition, Chance and Control, Art in the Age of Computers, which is brought to Chester with the support of the Tyre Charitable Trust. These exhibitions have further cemented our organization's ambition to bring great art to Chester and secure a permanent home within our city as a creative visual arts center and public art gallery of international standing. Showcasing the most innovative and exciting craft practice in the UK today, this exhibition marks the 70th anniversary of BBC Woman's Hour and the Woman's Hour Craft Prize is in association with BBC Radio 4 and the Crafts Council. The 12 finalists featured in the exhibition displayed a wide array of approaches to contemporary craft practice. With works made from woven willow and darn jumpers to a bespoke bicycle and intricate jewelry, traditional materials and historic skills meet new techniques in an exhibition that combine beauty and precise detail with challenging ideas. Visitors to the exhibition are encouraged to delve deeper view closer and unearth challenging ideas, including the decline of UK manufacturing, advances in medicine, and stories of memory and loss. And now we will walk through the Chester Visual Arts hosting of this wonderful exhibition, learning about the pieces and the artists that created them. Laura Youngson Cole works in leather and vellum, goatskin, creating sculptures. As a child, she made small and intricate pieces, once creating a living room in minute miniature with paper and only a few centimeters in length, a precious piece her father has kept. Her parents were an archeologist and environmental educator. She studied fine art and sculpture at Duncan Jordan Stowe College of Art in Dundee and the Royal College of Art. She discovered the material vellum when working with a bookbinder during part-time work. Her pieces are titled Haeckel to Aplidium. Cole explores the natural world, combining fact with fiction, creating biological yet fanciful pieces inspired by the 19th century biologist Ernst Haeckel, who studied the unseen marine world around us by microscope. Using a traditional book binding technique called pairing to thin the vellum, she creates the same translucency and illumination that is synonymous with ancient vellum manuscripts. Cole's piece titled Apolidium is an emotional one. This sea creature is used to develop cancer-fighting drugs, which reflects a loss that is very important to the artist. She explores the natural world and our relationship with it. Our next artist is Laura Ellen Bacon, a sculptor who works with willow, weaving, and other materials. As a child, she built tree houses and dens and their family orchard using offcuts from her grandfather, a joiner, and influenced by her father, an architect. She studied applied arts at the University of Derby and trained herself on the use of willow in her art. Bacon works with larger pieces. She confesses she's never completed a woven basket. Her piece on show is titled Form of Instinct. Her method uses two sticks and a hatch drawing design, knotting and weaving in an instinctual manner. Her pieces often wrap around and spill out of buildings. They seep, flow, flex in a parasitic fashion. She creates in an at times frenzied manner. They blur the lines between the natural and the man-made. Moving from the large forms of Laura Ellen Bacon, we next visit the large pottery forms of Alison Britton. Working in ceramics, she first discovered clay as a nine-year-old and finds it sad that it is largely left secondary schools when once you'd find a kiln in most schools. She enjoyed the tactile nature of clay and all its stages from squidgy to fired. She studied at the Central School of Art and Design and the Royal College of Art and was part of a movement in the 1970s, which through discord, parody and antagonism into their work, 
challenging established traditions of Bernard Leach and others. Britton uses the pot as a form of canvas, also working it as a painting. She doesn't make small things and uses hand throwing of slabs rather than a potter's wheel. Rolling the slabs out like pastry, she's honed her art and craft, being able to make consistent thicknesses and square slabs. Her pieces are form over function. Britton is attached to the idea of containment, of the dark hollow that is within the vessels. She paints both before firing and after glazing, pouring the glaze by hand with the jug, enjoying the challenge of it. She layers to get to the final piece. Her pieces here are fieldwork about nature with curves and awkward handles, core with fingers making grooves splashed with paint, evoking images of the body and pot form, and boy with its black and white reminding you of a puffin. From the use of ceramics to create, we move to the other end of the spectrum, from creation to destruction. Neil Brownsword and his piece titled Factory shows the destruction of our intangible cultural heritage. It is an installation work in ceramics, speaking to the decline of the ceramics industry and the lost knowledge of these skills. Growing up around this industry in Stoke-on-Trent, he was surrounded by pieces his grandmother accumulated while she worked in these factories. Brownsford himself became an apprentice at 16 and went on to study ceramics at the University of Wales at Cardiff, the Royal College of Art, and holds a PhD by practice from Brunel University. Brownsword is a mix of ethnographer, artist, and archaeologist, collecting shraff, the waste product of the ceramics industry. He sought the human in an industry that considered a human fingerprint on a piece as a flaw. In this work, he has trained artisans, including Rita Floyd, who worked as a flower maker for 45 years in this industry, making the china flower that they once would have been made by the dozen and paid by the dozen. As a metaphor for this decline of this industry, they make the flowers and then cast them away in a heap one by one. Their knowledge is being lost as a production leaves the United Kingdom and Neil Brownsford hopes to repurpose and reimagine these creative and manually dexterous skills that has all but disappeared. Next we visit Lin Chung who explores the idea that jewelry expresses ideas and comments on your identity and beliefs. She noted that when you ask someone about their jewelry, they will often tell you the stories behind it before ever mentioning the materials that it's made of. Chung grew up with a creative mother and says her creativity sewing was born out of fulfilling practical needs. And at 10 years old, she was a maker, sewing her own cushions, curtains, and bed linen. She discovered jewelry making while studying wood, metal, ceramics, and plastics at the University of Brighton going on to study goldsmithing, silversmithing, metalwork, and jewelry at the Royal College of Art. Chung's pieces on display are titled Delay Reactions. She is not political, but wanted to play on pin badges that show thoughts of the moment, but by casting these thoughts in stone, it shows the lasting permanence of thoughts. Chung also designed the 2012 Paralympics medal. She rarely sketches and often works unhindered with materials on different ideas until she finds a work being created that pops out. Next is Phoebe Cummings, who works with ceramics, creating sculpture that is intended to decay. Her art was born out of a need. She needed the economies of reusing material and using someone else's space. Installed on site, her performance pieces are of unfired clay, which decays and returns to its raw clay form ready to be used again. She studied 3D design and craft at the University of Brighton and the Royal College of Art. She discovered clay had properties that allowed her freedom to express her ideas. Cummings responds to the natural world and how we interpret that world through botanicals and architecture. Her piece titled Triumph of the Immaterial was inspired by an 18th century Mycenae fountain with Greek and Roman gods. This was displayed at state dinners in Saxony. Coming plays on the ephemeral and fragility. Her work was a fountain that eroded the clay over time, leaving the fragments and videography behind. Moving from the ornamental to the more functional, we look at Karen Hartley, who trained in 3D design, metalwork and jewelry at University College for the Creative Arts in Farnham. She also studied goldsmithing, 
silversmithing, metalwork, and jewelry at the Royal College of Art. Her dad was a watchmaker and grandfather had a jewelry shop. She enjoys metalwork for both its resistant and malleable nature. And with bicycles, their strict boundaries make you work harder to create with them. While working with bigger sculptural pieces, Hartley found she was spending more time pitching ideas than creating. She used her cycling journeys around London to ponder her art and craft. She realized that creating bespoke bicycles allowed her to fulfill a passion for creative function and aesthetics. Working with bronze brazing, silver soldering, piercing and wax carving, Hartley creates work such as this piece titled Design Museum 953 Gravel Road Bike, which was crafted for the Design Museum's Cycle Revolution show in 2015. We now move from Hartley's functional craft to another, Peter Marigold's Bleed series of furniture and cabinets. He is a designer maker of an eclectic variety of works. Studying sculpture at Central St. Martin's, he went on to a career in theatrical set building before turning to furniture after studying design products at the Royal College of Art. However, his projects have ranged from furniture to form card, his bioplastic product that can be wet and formed into any shape before hardening. Also to a 188 meter public art piece in Edinburgh. His work here, Marigold has explored his interest in movement and in decay. Inspired by the observations of the world around him, here he stripped the steel nails of their zinc coating, allowing them to react with the tannin of the cedar wood changing what he's made into something that nature affects. Marigold is a designer that isn't attached to any one focus, but rather explores experimentation, making different things happen. Next we visit Celia Pym's works in textiles. Her varied background gives her the ability to bring us the feelings of vulnerability, care and repair. She studied textiles at the Royal College of Art, sculpture at Harvard University, and also trained as a teacher and nurse. Her work titled, Where Holes Happen, have us finding while mending pieces of clothing that something real gets said. How things get worn down, tell stories. Clothing can hold the shape of the other person. In her project, Parallel Practices, with herself and medical students, Pym explored the art of mending and anatomy, demonstrating that craft and science have something to teach each other. Often the item is the thing we feel most comfortable in, and one that reminds us of loss. It may have been worn by someone close to you or made by them. In this piece, we see the sweater of a retired doctor made by someone close to him. While sitting and darning with the doctor, him find, finds the process nurturing to the owner and respectful to their stories. It is not the process of recycling, but rather she has discovered how the holes in clothing tell the story of how that person moved and lived. Something as simple as holes in the forearms showing through that damage how the owner, perhaps an artist, moved and worked. Even more telling is the process of darning those holes, showing the care due to the person. Moving from textiles to jewelry and boxes, we next visit Romilly Samara Smith's work. She is a jeweler and maker working with interpreters. She lost the use of her hands due to multiple sclerosis, but finds it has sharpened her mind and creative skills as those senses are heightened due to the loss of the other senses. Her career in making began with studies at the Camberwell School of Arts and Crafts, and she was also an accomplished bookbinder. During a retrospective of her bookbinding at Yale University, she was introduced to jeweler Lucy Gledhill, now her translator, along with Laura in Yu and Anna Wales. Samara Smith's works titled Boxes were born from a desire to find small gifts for her children. She began looking for Roman coins and discovered a wealth of ancient artifacts. She knew she, craft, she could craft with them using the clustering of many objects to create in a way that was freer than jewelry making as they would have been too awkward as jewelry. Here she uses an assortment of found items including Tudor glass, an old button and an Anglo-Saxon ring including the piece titled Winter Box Tree and Krakatoa. As a bookbinder, Samara Smith had begun to use metal on books, finding appealing with the bashing of the copper wire and bending the metal into shapes. Now, putting life into long lost objects, she's touched that objects are everywhere we walk in Great Britain. 
that there are treasures beneath our feet. She gives the objects new life while paying homage to the place from where it came. From these boxes, we move to the vessels of Andrea Walsh, who is a ceramicist. She studied fine art at Staffordshire University. During her studies, she experimented with different materials, but wanted to learn to work glass without the aid of technicians. She then studied at Dudley's International Glass Center and also glass at Edinburgh College of Art, where she learned to slip cast and went on to be a resident into industry at Wedgwood. She is drawn to the idea of the vessel being a way to contain something precious, almost like an oyster holding a pearl. She exhibits softer organic forms. These three pieces are titled contained boxes. They are jewel-like, even capturing light. Walsh pairs the structure down to its minimal elements. She works with fine bone china and the black bone china pieces contain a box layered in 24 karat gold. Each piece is polished by hand. They are tactile and translucent and have similar approaches to jewelry design. Each vitrine cradles a small box within. Walsh's focus was honed during her approach on current forms after a research visit to Japan. She had a moment of clarity regarding her work. She noticed the immense consideration and thought of how the artwork was displayed and how you experience it. It was influential. From the delicate and minimal work of Andrea Walsh, we moved to the large sculptures of our last 12th finalist, Emma Wolfenden. Working primarily in glass, she studied 3D design, ceramics and glass at the West Surrey College of Art and Design in Farnham with a final year at the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia, then going on to study glass at the Royal College of Art. With partner Tord Bonechu, she also created the organization Trans Glass, where they used recycled glass to create new objects, cutting and reassembling everyday bottles to become jugs and carafes. Begun in London, it now trains young people in glassmaking in Guatemala City. As well as molding and blowing glass, Wolfenden also works with gypsum fiberglass and plastic, using wax casts to model, form, and cast shapes that are quite alien, but based around the human form. With traits of the classical, she explores the reflection of observed human behavior. In her new work for the exhibition, she uses mold blown and free blown and mixed media that are then assembled in a manner that is somewhat unsettling, but with traits of humor, albeit the strange. Wolfenden herself describes her work as funny in an absurd way, yet graceful too, cold yet very sensual as well. She primarily creates one-off work that crosses the fine art and craft worlds. She is always learning from the variety of materials she works with and is always intrigued by the body and parts of the body. These pieces elegantly move from opaque to transparent. Now that we have visited the 12 finalists of the Woman's Hour Craft Prize exhibition, it is time to reveal the winner. Will it be Karen Hartley's Design Museum 953 Gravel Road Bike? Celia Pem's Where Holes Happen? Peter Marigold's Bleed Series? Laura Ellen Bacon's Form of Instinct? Laura Youngson Cole's Haeckel to Euclidium? Alison Britton's Boy, Core, and Fieldwork? Andrea Walsh's Contained Boxes, Romilly Samara Smith's Boxes, including Winter Box Tree and Krakatoa, Phoebe Cummings' Triumph of the Immaterial, Emma Wolfenden's New Work, Lynn Chung's Delayed Reaction Series, or finally, Neil Brownsword's Factory. The winner was Phoebe Cummings' Triumph of the Immaterial, her fountain of raw clay. Described by Cummings, the work celebrates the endless possibility for clay to be made and unmade and considers craft skills and the decorative from a contemporary position. We hope you enjoyed the Chester Visual Arts Learning Program's traveling presentation on this important Victoria and Albert BBC Radio 4 and Crafts Council exhibition, the Woman's Hour Craft Prize. We look forward to welcoming you into our Chester Visual Arts Center and exhibition space for our next exhibitions and programs. Thank you again for joining us and please visit us at our website, chestervisualarts.org.uk, as well as on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube to keep up with our upcoming exhibitions and programs. Have a wonderful day or evening and goodbye from all of us at Chester Visual Arts and the CVA Learning Program. See you soon.